Hello again and welcome back to Illegally Cited. This is BGFH and I am back for a video that's a little later than uh, expected, a little later than I really wanted it to be, but um, talking about the rest of E3, at least the press conferences and basically the chaos of Monday and Tuesday. Um, so I did the original E3 video for the Sunday press conferences, EA and <clears throat> Bethesda, and those were pretty interesting, um, but there's tons and tons of stuff to cover. Like, I want to actually talk a little bit, a lot more about E3, I want to talk a little bit about WWDC, and then I want to talk a little bit, if I have time, and this is going to be a long one, so... Uh, you know, grab a, grab some popcorn or whatever and uh, enjoy. <laughs> but um, I also want to talk a little bit about an interesting bit of assistive technology news that has come into being over the past few days as well. So well, let's just get right into it here. We have slowed down a little bit. We are not playing Road Redemption for the background of this video. Instead, I figured, you know what? I need to concentrate a little bit more on trying to remember everything and talk about stuff for the video. So playing something just a little bit more kind of relaxing, not going to do any spoilers, just wander around a beautiful, beautiful environment for a game that I have done a low vision spotlight for on the channel. A little game called Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. Um, very, very cool game. Very pretty looking game. Um... Yeah, just really nice looking. So, as we prepare to wander around this wilderness here, I uh, just want to kind of start with Monday morning. So, originally I had planned for things to go a little bit differently. You know, I was like, oh, I'm, you know, a little bit before E3, I'm like, okay, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to watch all these conferences and make videos sort of like how I did last year. Um, but I didn't have quite as much time to do that. I had to return to work a little bit sooner, so I wasn't able to do some of that. And then I ended up um, getting this big distraction on Monday morning. Literally, I checked my phone, and I want to say it was like 20 minutes, 25 minutes before the Microsoft press conference uh, started on Monday morning my Oculus Rift had arrived at the apartment's front office. So it's like, um, yeah, I'm going to go grab this sucker. So I started out, I watched the conference, you know, I, I was good for a while, but I just couldn't devote all my effort and time into E3 when I had this sweet new toy that I had been just waiting to play with for the, a long time, you know, you've heard me be a little snarky on Twitter, maybe even on the YouTube channel a little bit, just about, you know, like, oh, gee, I wonder how long this will take to get here. Um, but I'm not here really to talk much about VR. Those are some future videos, and I've played with it a little bit, not having a whole lot of time the last couple of days because um, of work and various things, but I have played with it a little, and I do have a lot to say. So enjoy future content about that topic. But we start the day on Monday with Microsoft, and their press conference was actually quite good. Um, talk about the hardware first. Um, everyone was speculating that we're going to see some new consoles and or hear about them, and they were right. Um, in August, we get the Xbox One S, which is their um, white and a smaller version of the Xbox One system. Um, and there's different hard drive models. So, you know, basically you can choose your price point that'll fit for you. Um, not a whole lot else to say about that. I mean, it's it's smaller, um, it's white. Um, like I said, it comes in different storage sizes. But the other thing is, is that um, they also have custom controllers that you can now get or if you want to, you know, color your buttons differently or color the controller, maybe put your own gamer tag or name on there or whatever you want to do, you can do that sort of a thing. So that's kind of nice. Um, 
And I really didn't think they would actually, with that console, you know, you wouldn't think they would maybe really talk about their other rumored system, the Scorpio, but they did, and they rena- they re- they referred to it as Scorpio in their press briefing. Um, and I was kind of surprised. And it, we're kind of looking at probably around the end of next year, so the end of 2017 for Scorpio. And um, I don't know, the whole, you know... Everyone with like video cards and everything recently with NVIDIA announcing their new stuff and everything. Um, you know, the whole buzz is about teraflops now. Like, what the hell is a teraflop? You know, you're like, um, well, it's a bunch of processing something or other. But basically, it's going to be bigger. I think they were estimating the rumored P- uh, PlayStation Neo to be about four or so. And I think, if I remember correctly, the... Um, Scorpio was going to be around six, so they said, oh yeah, we're going to, you know, this is going to be a new thing, and all the current stuff is going to work, so that'll be good, but it's going to be a lot more powerful, and they did mention that they are going in on VR, and it wouldn't surprise me at all with how well they're working together so far. I have a feeling they didn't come out and say it, but I would, I if I was a betting man, I would probably say we're going to get Oculus Rift support on the Xbox One. I mean, they've already partnered with the Rift as far as getting Xbox One controllers in the package, and they're working together in a few other ways, so that wouldn't surprise me one bit. Um, The thing that I like, though, is they talked about um, Xbox Play Anywhere, where a lot of all of their first-party games now are going to be, basically, you buy them on one platform, Windows 10 or Xbox One, and then you will be able to, you will be able to um, play these games on the other platform. Not only will you be able to play them, some are cross-platform play, so, like, Gears of War, they said, um, you know, oh, you can play multiplayer, like, Xbox against PC and whatever, your saves will carry over, so maybe, you know, you got your big old desktop at home, but maybe... You want to bring your Xbox somewhere. You want to play with your profile on an, on a friend's machine. Um, you're going to be able to do that. So there's a lot of that stuff happening. So I'm actually really pleased with that because basically what they're saying is, yeah, um, you know, they're, they're they're kind of merging. It's really starting to finally come into effect. The thing that Microsoft has been talking about in some capacity for quite some time is the kind of merging of Windows and Xbox into one more singular entity. And I think that's actually starting to happen, and I like it because, especially the first parties, which are, you know, that's where your exclusives are. Well, if I have a good PC, I kind of really don't need an Xbox One unless I really want one. So, like, I don't even, like, I have an Xbox One so I can use it, but I really don't have to worry about, oh, the new... Um, Scorpio is next year, unless there's something really, really compelling that I want it for. I don't really have to worry because I can play it on my current system, and I have a pretty, generally a pretty sweet rig right now as far as a PC goes. So guess what? I'm just gonna play it on play it on there, uh, play it on Windows 10. Now, of course, you're gonna be doing it through the Microsoft Store. You're not gonna be, you know, getting. Xbox One and Steam, that's just not the way it's going to work, Like, which is what a lot of people would theoretically think or want. Um, That's not the way it's going to work. But yeah, so that'll be cool. I'm looking forward to that. Then they talked about like groups and clubs and different things, so like if you're kind of looking for a certain type of game you want to play with somebody, kind of like they said a gamer want ad or whatever, you know, I was like, oh, I want to get together with a group of people and play this, or you can join a club that's like, oh, I'm interested in this type of, um, or this topic or whatever, you can just kind of go do that and um, get friends and stuff. The other, but the other thing that I'm they didn't talk about in the press conference, but I do want to mention it just because of what this channel is, of course, is the upcoming accessibility. I talked about it in an earlier video, I think the state of accessibility video that I did not too terribly long ago, but um, with the summer update to the Xbox One, we're going to be getting some more improved, you know, we're going to be getting Cortana, 
we're going to be getting um, and you can use the headset you don't have to have a connect huzzah huzzah um, you can your narrator is going to be expanded and improved so I'm here's hoping that they're actually going to work more with third-party apps I remember when I tried the Netflix app on the uh, Xbox one demo video that I did it kind of didn't take too kindly to that my system just kind of froze solid so I'm really excited to see both in Windows 10 and Xbox um, what Microsoft is going to deliver with that pretty soon um, so yeah a lot of accessibility stuff look you know to look forward to that's excellent so as far as games um, they didn't talk about it at the conference, but um, I'll just mention it here because I thought of it. Agents of Mayhem. Remember how I love the Saints Row games, especially 3 and 4. Not only just because they're completely ridiculous and insane, which they are, but also just because they are... <clears throat> they really make the open world stuff accessible. You know, they have the in... the. I don't have to rely on a mini-map. If I make a waypoint on the main map, I can have in-world arrow, big glowy arrows to tell me where to go, which is, believe it or not, a huge accessibility uh, thing that makes the game much, much easier for me to play. Um, so the developers of that, Volition, are actually making um, Agents of Mayhem, which seems to indicate that it sort of takes place in the Saints Row universe, but it's kind of like this group of agents. They all have different you know characters and personalities and all kinds of things and I don't know what it is it's supposed to be I mean it's like a third person action game in a city but it's more like lasers and crazy stuff and but from what little footage I saw of it it, it looks it's early but it looks uh, it looks promising it looks interesting so there is that um, Gears of War 4 um, I kind of fell off. I played the first two Gears of War. I think I own three, um, but I never got around to playing it, and I just kind of fell off there. But I, I don't know. Gears of War 4 looks pretty interesting, so, you know, maybe one of these days. It's probably not something I'm going to, you know, fall for the hype exactly right away, but uh, eventually, you know, I'll probably pick it up on the Xbox or Windows 10 and uh, give that a shot. Um, so, of course, you're going to have your single-player, multiplayer and um, your horde mode, which people have really come to love and uh, expect from the game. ReCore, which is coming out in September, um, kind of a third-person action-y game. Um, I'm not exactly sure what to think of it yet, but the footage that they showed looked uh, intriguing. So, again, that's going to be one of those games where I don't know that I'm going to pick it up right away. Um... I need to see a little bit more of it to really form a solid opinion either way, but it, it does intrigue me, and again, it's something that I can pick up and play on uh, either platform, uh, PC or Xbox, so, you know, I just might uh, take a look at that. I mean, it, it looked pretty decent, so something to look forward to there. Sea of Thieves. I know people are really loving this one. Um, I have kind of mixed feelings just because of the whole multiplayer thing, and I just don't play a whole lot of multiplayer games. But admittedly, if you like pirates, this game might just be for you. It see, it's first person, but it has this kind of like really bright art style, and it's like you're on these pirate ships, and you, each of you, it seems like you have to each play your own role, like... One person um, steers the boat. You can get into fights with other uh, other ships. You have to like, you know, hoist the sails and stuff. And like, and you each you have to communicate with each other in order to, you know, do all the different tasks that you have to do for your boat. You fight other pirates. You you plunder. It it looks. I, I definitely want to know more. And it's. Fr I mean, it seems like a really. Finally, a significant game from Rare. Yeah, Rare is actually making games again. Who would have thought? Um, so that's something potentially that could be pretty cool. Scalebound. This one's not coming out till next year. Um, I, I don't know. Like, part of me thinks it looks interesting. It's kind of like this open world thing, and <coughs> I think you can play it solo. 
but you can also play up to four player co-op. Uh, what they showed the, the, at the uh, demo was basically like these four player thing, trying to take down this giant monster thing. Um, you know, kind of working together to take down these giant beasts, which is cool, but I, I don't know. It's just something about it. It hasn't clicked with me yet. I mean, it doesn't look bad. I'm sure a lot of people will like it. Who knows? I might like it too. Um, but I'm just not immediately hyped for that game just yet. Final Fantasy 15. Admittedly, it looks more actiony than Final Fantasy ever has, which for me is actually a good thing because, for the most part, as I've said on the channel before, um, menu games, turn-based games generally bore the heck out of me, so i just not really a fan. I'm still not hyped for Final Fantasy XV. Um, you know, kind of a weird road trip sort of game sounds sort of interesting, and maybe it'll be one of the first games to actually get me into the series. Who knows? But there you go. I don't know a whole lot about that. Dead Rising 4. This was rumored before the show as well, and it is coming out by the end of the year, so they say. And uh, I have played the first three games. I haven't finished any of them. To me, they're kind of they're really fun playgrounds, but like I haven't done videos on them yet, and I should. The first two had this really weird save system, which was either you loved it or you hated it. I I it was unique, but I kind of found found it to be a pain in the ass, and it kind of eventually turned me away from the game. Once I had fun, just you know, once the fun of just, um, you know, fighting zombies with all kinds of crazy weapons wore off. Because the whole gist of these is, like, it's a third-person action game, but there's literally, like, hundreds of zombies, and you're in these different environments. Like, the first one, you were in a shopping mall. Then you were in, like, um, like a different cities and stuff like that. And it was just lunacy. Like, you could pick up anything in the, web, uh, the environment and use it as a weapon, you could craft your own weapons. You could take, like, a, I don't know, like a, a blowtorch and something else to make a crazy uh, flaming weapon. You could do all just all kinds of lunacy. Um, and so, I don't know. You know, it, it's one that I will definitely consider in the future. Um, but we'll see how that one goes. Forza Horizon 3, I've played a couple of the Forza games. Um, thankfully, as the Forza games have gone on, they've, been a, they've made them a bit more accessible as far as, like, they're simulation games, but, like, they have a whole bunch of, like, difficulty settings and sliders to be like, you know what, I just want to enjoy the act of driving um, and look at these beautiful car models and roads and whatever, um, so the, you know, uh, and the, the Horizon is like a spin-off series where, like, it's more open world instead of closed circuit tracks, and, um, this one's set in Australia, so you get your regular cars, but then you get, like, dune buggies and kind of other off-road things, which looks pretty sweet. I actually might end up checking that one out, because that one does sound rather appealing, actually, and everyone raves about the Forza Horizon game, so... Maybe it's about time I uh, investigate that. Halo Wars 2, kind of a real-time strategy game. I didn't play the first one. I just, real-time strategy really does not interest me. Again, the closest thing I got to that was Dungeon Keeper. Back in the day, Dungeon Keeper 1 and 2, which admittedly are really, really cool. Um, but that's coming out early next year. You know, if you like Halo, you like real-time strategy... Um, that could be your thing, but, um, it just, nah, not really my, not my really, really my cup of tea. Another one, Gwent, the, uh, card game from The Witcher, uh, the recent Witcher game that I covered on the channel, Witcher 3. Um, they're making a standalone game for it, and if you're really into collectible card games, like your, uh, Hearth Hearthstone and different things like that, you may want to check that out. Um, again, it's something probably that I'm not really going to get into, but I know a lot of people are getting really huge into those, so there you go. State of Decay 2. This was one that I, I have gotten the first State of Decay, but I just I, I haven't really gotten into it. I don't know 
why, um, but it's... It, yes, it's another zombie game, but it was really an interesting take where, like, the pl the characters that you actually played matter. Like, if you die, they if they died, they're dead. And then you have to take over a ra new random character in the world. And there were just some really interesting things going on with that game that I really wish I would have gotten into. And it sounds like State of Decay 2 really seems like they're starting to polish and expand. Because it's a small dev team, so... You know, they're talking, um, you know, they're fixing things that people didn't like about the first one. You know, they've got a little bit more room, wiggle room to make the game that they want to make. So, State of Decay 2 could be something pretty cool. Minecraft, of course, uh, being everywhere. Minecraft, um, they announced you can now play together on Windows 10. Xbox One and mobile, so your Android, your iOS app, you can play those together now. Um, not only can you do that, but you can set up these, uh, oh god, what do they call them? Uh, I forget what they call them. Basically, you can set up like a, a map on a server, and you can play together with your friends, and then even when you're not playing, like if you have it running, um, other people can still build and do stuff and then we come back you can kind of you know go just go see what they built kind of like how we're doing how jawbreaker and i have our server on the pc so especially once the windows 10 version gets fleshed out a little bit more you know jawbreaker and i have talked about stopping the minecraft server just because we're not playing it really anymore but as the windows 10 version gets more up to date you know we haven't made any really crazy things you know, crazy contraptions with, like, pistons or any of the really logic stuff. We've just been building, you know, like, structures. So I could conceivably see, especially if it doesn't cost anything, if it would work to set up one of these kind of hosted things through the Windows server, we may just migrate to that instead of having a server like we do now. In the uh, So we could conceivably do something like that. From the creators of Limbo, we have Inside. I have no clue what this game is, but it's coming out within like the next month or two, and what little I've seen looks really sort of uh, dark and interesting, so it may be kind of one of those sleeper things that just kind of sneaks up on you that I might have to uh, check out. We Happy Few. Now, this one... It is kind of, I mean, it's sound, I was curious about it last year when they did a teaser trailer. Um, but now that I've seen a little bit more of it this year, this is one of the games that I'm genuinely intrigued about for this year. It's a first-person game, but it's not a shooter. It's sort of this weird thing of, like, there's, I don't know, there's this, like, society and... Everyone's on these, like, happy pills. I think they call it Joy. And you don't want... Your character doesn't want to be controlled and take the pills. You know, the little demo that they showed, it was like, oh, yeah, I'm in my office, and somebody's trying to get me to go to a birthday party, and, you know, we're going to, you know, break a pinata, and yada, yada. Well, you end up going there, and I won't necessarily spoil what happens, but... Uh, Let's just say things take a little bit of a turn. Um, they find out that, hey, you are not taking your joy pills. And so if you are found not to be taking them, yeah, society does not take very well to that. So it sounds like there's going to be a lot of maybe some stealth, maybe some action. Um, it just seems like a really interesting, really twisted premise for a game that I'm genuinely... Oh, whoops, I totally... Wow, okay, I don't know what I just did there, but okay. Um, but it seems like a really, really unique uh, type of experience. I, I want to see what that, what that is like. They showed a... I didn't know what the heck was going on in the, the trailer that they, showed, that they showed, but Tekken 7, so if you're into the Tekken uh, or fighting game uh, scene, that could definitely be one to look out for. We haven't had a numbered Tekken sequel for quite some time. I think the last one they did was some kind of a Tekken tag. 
Honestly, I haven't really followed Tekken since the amazing Tekken 3 on the uh, PlayStation, where not only they had the fighting game, but they had all those cool, like, offshoots, like, what was it, like, Tekken Force, which was, like, a brawler, and you had this, like, Tekken, like, volleyball thing where you were, like, kicking and punching these different, you had these different, like, uh, balls that you could do, like a beach ball or a big old metal one. It was just a weird freaking game, but it was cool. I hope they bring some of that craziness back, because that's something that needs to... Uh, happen again. Tekken 3 was awesome. I loved it. So now we move on to Ubisoft. Um, they, I don't know, they had a few things in there. I'm not going to mention every game. You know, we're just kind of going through the major ones. I've left out a couple here and there, but um, I'm just going to mention kind of the ones that I've really, that are kind of notable to me in some way. Uh, Watch Dogs 2, I wanted to like the first Watch Dogs, but I just never really got into it. I love the concept of this, you know, guy being able to hack and control different things or anything in the environment. Um, but I don't know, I just, something about the first game just didn't click with me, and so I really didn't hardly play it. Um, I watched it on YouTube, and some of the stuff was kind of interesting, but... The story itself even wasn't really all that compelling. It's like the main character is really meh, whatever. And I really didn't care about the story, but it was just kind of something just to see what the city was like, what kind of hacks you had to do, what some of the missions were. Um, Watch Dogs 2, totally different character, takes place in L.A. Um, I think it's L.A., yeah, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it looks... Or is it L.A. or San Francisco? I totally forget now. But um, it, it looks to be there's a lot there's more focus on, like, different hacking things, parkour and running around stuff. He's, a, like, a lot more nimble, so to speak. So there's that kind of thing going on. And if I, I thought I saw in one of the gameplay clips that I saw, it looked like there was some sort of uh, glowy navigation indicator down the road if you had an objective so it's like oh travel to this waypoint on your map um so you know that again may be a thing that just helps me i, I really don't want to play an open world city game like that unless it has that kind of thing because i cannot literally sit and look at a tiny mini map and watch the road at the same time it's a very very important feature, especially now that I've seen a couple different games, even like um, Red Faction Guerrilla, which I really need to cover on the channel at some point. Um, now that I know those systems, or that an open world game can really work well for low vision users, um, it's kind of what I expect. Um, <clears throat> while we're on, even though it's not Ubisoft, um, it's not one. It wasn't on any of the conferences, but another open world game that I want to mention that looks really kind of cool and again I don't know what its uh, navigation system is like because it's uh, you know takes place in older like in the 60s I want to say 68 Mafia 3 the older Mafia games I wanted to like but they were just clunky and I just I really didn't get into them but I watched like a 20 minute demo and it to me it looks really cool this takes place in like a fictional um, like down in the deep south, um, New Orleans, I forget what they call their city, but it's basically New Orleans. You got like different areas of the city, uh, you got a bayou and it's just, you know, your guy has, uh, his, uh, his gang, his mob gets taken over and, basically almost gets wiped out and so he's out for revenge and he's partnering with these crime lords and like you have to you kind of have people under you and when you take over territories you kind of have to watch how you divvy up everything because you can actually have if you make some of your like lieutenants and stuff mad they'll actually turn on you and then you have a revolution on your hands and they're just i mean they had a ton like in that gameplay video they had tons of like just great classic rock like you're literally um, there was a part on a, um, where you're sneaking through the swamp trying to take out a guy and Credence starts playing and it just fit perfectly. 
Uh, but there was other really good music too. There was like some blues and classic rock kind of stuff. And just, it just was really kind of neat. And that's something that I really want to keep an eye on. Um, I know they didn't have GPS back then, of course, but like, I'm hoping just as a, like, not even, a, not even a disability accessibility thing, but like, I'm hoping that they do have some sort of in world navigation, just as far as usability, because that's not just, you know, for low vision gamers like us, you know, it helps everybody. Like if you don't have to look at a tiny mini map, you can keep your eye on the road. I mean, okay, it's not perfectly real for the time, but you know what? It greatly, greatly improves playability. So I'm really hoping that that does, because that's a game that I really want to like, and I want to say it's coming out in, like, September or October this year. I want to say the beginning of October, maybe? Um, yeah, it, it, it looks pretty, pretty neat. Back to Ubisoft, Steep, um, kind of this, again, I don't know if I want to call it an open world, but it basically takes place on this mountain. You and your friends can get together, and there's all kinds of different events that you can do. So, like, you've got skiing and snowboarding and hang gliding and... Oh, what the heck? Oh, I missed this before. Okay, well, you know what? That's a story thing. I don't want to spoil anything. We will just keep on walking away. But, um, yeah, so, I don't know. I mean, it. I, I would like, I'm not so interested in all the types of events, but I wouldn't mind a good snowboarding game again. I loved on the N64. I played the heck out of 1080 snowboarding, and I also, um, like, SSX Tricky. That was a really fun SSX game, playing in the GameCube days back in the day. Uh, yeah, I would not mind a good snowboarding game, so hopefully that turns out to be something good. Ghost Recon Wildlands, again, if you're into that kind of military shooter-esque kind of things. I'm not really into it, but, you know, you, you know, it's Ghost Recon, um, you know, your typical kind of military military-esque game. Not super into it, but I know a lot of people are into that, so that's pretty cool. Now, South Park, on the other hand, I really liked The Stick of Truth a couple years ago. I, I That was one of the few Let's Plays I actually did on the channel, so you can go check that out if you want to. Um, South Park, The Fractured Butthole. <laughs> it's just like the name when I heard that. I was like, okay, really, guys? Or Fractured Butthole. Um, it is coming out this December. I want to say December 6th, if I remember correctly. And they've made some upgrades to it. A more in-depth battle system, so it's not just like, I'm going to stand on the left, you're going to stand on the right, and we are going to attack each other, take turns and attack each other. Like, the environment comes into play a lot more, uh, different things like that. So, that looks pretty great. And, uh, I should mention, if you haven't played the original South Park, The Stick of Truth and you want to, just go ahead and pre-order the um, the new one. Go ahead and pre-order Fractured But Whole, because if you do, you can also get a uh, free copy of The Stick of Truth for any platform you want, Xbox One, PS4, or the PC. So if you're into South Park, now is a perfect time to... Uh, get those games. You could pre-order the one and start playing uh, the first game right now. So definitely, definitely going to be playing that later this year, early next year. That's one I'm really looking forward to from Ubisoft. For Honor, this is a medieval game they showed off last year. kind of reminds me of Rise. That was an early Xbox One game um, that eventually came to PC. I did a spotlight video on it. It was okay. Um, they're focusing on like kind of more of a unique combat experience, so I don't know exactly what that's going to be like. Um, but, you know, it, it's your medieval game if you want to do some medieval melee combat kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know much about the story. I really don't know um, other than 
a little bit of the combat stuff I've seen during uh, their gameplay demo. I mean, it, it looks cool. I mean, it, it could potentially be a game that I'll want to play. Um, but yeah, For Honor, Medieval Combat, if, you, if you're looking for that kind of a thing. Eagle Flight VR. This was something I think that they first unveiled at the Game Developers Conference a couple months ago, and I believe it is coming to the Oculus, so it may be something that I'll check out. Kind of a weird concept for a game, but it actually sounds like it just kind of might work. It's like, you're in, I want to, was it Paris? Or something? Um, but you're in some city, and you're birds. Uh, they have like a free flight mode where you can just fly around, but then it's like multi, you have multiplayer where there's different kind of modes and you're just swooping around the city as a bird. That could be kind of neat. Um, from the footage I saw when they unveiled it at GDC, it, it looked um, intriguing. It's something that I'm, you know, may definitely check out, uh, depending on what, you know, like I said, I have to kind of... One of the things about VR is you really have to kind of watch the interface as a low-vision user because... Uh, <laughs> That can make or break a game as far as being able to see it enough, especially the interface, to get going. So, but yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to that, actually. Trials of the Blood Dragon, basically taking two of their uh, franchises, their Trials series, which I really need to cover at some point, and Blood Dragon, which is a spin-off game of Far Cry, a first-person shooter a couple years ago, that was this ridiculous 80s like parody you're like 80s but action hero futuristic things there were like dinosaurs or something and i don't know i played a little bit of it and it was just weird i mean it was i liked a lot about it but there was a few things that i just the interface that i just didn't really like but they're combining it into kind of this like 2d kind of crazy action game that is out now actually so it might be something to kind of wish list for a later time Then we move on to Sony, God of War. Now, this is something that they also, they had rumored prior to the Sony conference, and I was like, eh, whatever. You know, the, the first God of War was really cool when it came out. Second one, me, whatever. You know, I just, I kind of fell off after that. I mean, they were, you know, they focused on, like, huge spectacle, you know, like, just crazy battles. I mean, there was n really no redeeming qualities about the main character Kratos. I mean, like, he's just a dick. He just, I, I'm just, I'm going to kill everything, you know? Um, but this one actually kind of, whoa, what was that? That was a weird kind of graphic -y glitch. Um, this one kind of caught my attention for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one of the things I didn't like about the other God of War games is the camera angles were so unpredictable. Like, sometimes it was easy to see, and then sometimes they would just to show the to highlight the environment and how big a boss or how big a one of these set pieces were. The camera would be so far zoomed out it was like so hard to see. Um, but this one, it looks like if you're you know like if you're familiar with Gears of War or Resident Evil Four or Five. Um, it's, you know, you're zoomed in a little bit more. It's still third person, but it's kind of like over the shoulder kind of a thing. So it's a different perspective. And then it's this older Kratos, I guess. And he has a son. Like in the gameplay demo that Sony started with, he is teaching his son how to hunt. And then they get into some trouble. Like there's monsters and like the son misses, you know, he misses the the shot, and then they get into trouble and whatever, and, you know, Kratos is still a dick about it, he's like, oh, gee, you know, you missed, get out there and fix it, or, you know, just yelling at him all the time, so, it's going to be sort of interesting, I, I mean, if anything, I just want to see where they take this father-son sort of thing, especially with a, you know, kind of a, you know, I would say, like, your anti-hero character like Kratos, I mean, he's just you know, this big brute that, you know, okay, the other games you're basically fighting things and sexual mini games and getting it on, whatever. Yeah, um, I'm genuinely curious to see where this reboot of, it's just called God of War, is what it's going to be. Yes, sir, 
Oh boy. The weird thing of the show, by far, has got to be Death Stranding. The strange teaser from Hideo Kojima of Metal Gear fame. Yeah, well, he came out on stage and he released some sort of conceptual thing. Um, I don't know if I'd call it a teaser or what I would call it. I'm just going to say go watch it because make of it what you will. I had no clue what I was watching. Um, but yeah, um, Death Stranding. That's at least, I would, I, I, if I had to guess, I'd bet two, three years out. Um, but I, yeah, I have no idea what I just saw. So um, that was a weird one, but they brought him out. Believe it or not, The Last Guardian is supposedly finally going to come out this year. It's only been at E3 for like the last seven years. Uh, um, I, I want to say it's like October, beginning of October, that um, that The Last Guardian is coming. Um, you know, for fans of the games, what are they? Ico, Shadow of Colossus, that whole, it has that same style... Um, you you got this giant weird beast thing that you're friends with and you're fighting other beasts and I don't really know the whole premise of it, but I know a lot of people are, are psyched about it. Um, and I just, the, the main thing that I wonder is a game, you know, when a game has been in development for that long, you know, it, can it even possibly live up to the hype or, or expectation? What are you Okay, my phone just started talking. Um, yeah, I, I mean, can it possibly even live up to it? I mean, I, but I'm really glad that it's coming out, both so that just that people can play it, and frankly, I'm kind of tired of hearing about it. It's kind of like, I really, really want, I just, I want something Half-Life related to come out, just so we'll stop hearing about Half-Life 3. Like, it, it's probably not going to happen, but like, any little thing, oh, there's this weird pixel thing that I saw, and like it's it's gonna it's gonna be Half Life Three, and no, it isn't, you guys. No, it isn't. Just no. Would you just no? It isn't. Um, kind of the thing with Last Guardian. Like I, I'm just I, I. It does not need to be at another E3 at this point. Horizon Zero Dawn. Now this, along with God of War. This, I would say, is my other game that I want to see from Sony. They showed it last year. It's this open world thing, but it's not a city. It's like some just open world area. And you're fighting these creatures, but they're... They're like robots. They're, I don't know, they're weird. It's these like these robotic animals and... You, the combat is like really kind of in depth. Like you have to kind of take them down in stages, and you're trying to like get cores from them so that you can upgrade and do stuff, or you can like hack their core so that you can turn them into allies or stuff like. I, I don't know really what it's going to be in the end, but it sounds kind of cool. And definitely one of the games that I would like to, uh, would like to see. Um, Horizon Zero Dawn, that is a 2017 game, but one of the cooler ones out there on the, uh, from the Sony show. Yeah, um, Detroit Becoming Human, or I think it's Becoming Human, uh, but Detroit, this is from the creators of, um, Indigo Prophecy, and, oh, I just went stupid, what was the game on the PS3? The David Cage games, man, they're, they're really interesting in premise, but they just have, I mean, in a way they're charming because you kind of know what, you're getting something unique, you're getting something weird, but like, there's kind of some jank to it as well. But 
So this one, it's all about, like, these, you know, androids or whatever, and, like, what is it to be human, and they showed kind of a, like, I, I don't know what that game is going to be, um, but if I had to guess, you know, it would be fairly similar to that company's, um, was it Quantic Dreams, I think, uh, their, la their previous title, so... If you're into the whole kind of science fiction thing, that might be one that you want to keep an eye on. Resident Evil 7, which you can actually get a demo for <clears throat> if you're a PlayStation Plus member right now. Um, the, believe it or not, there, even though it's Resident Evil 7, um, and they subtitle it Biohazard, which is what it was called in Japan, you know, the series, instead of Resident Evil, they called it Biohazard, they're switching it from third person to first person, and they also announced that, oh yeah, um, by the way, uh, eventually this is going to be a first person, uh, you'll be able to play the whole game on your TV or in VR if you want to. Um, and what they showed on the show floor looked pretty uh, different, especially for a Resident Evil game. Since the press conferences, since I'm recording this a bit later, I've, I'm have i really curious to know more because uh, I've heard people trying it out in VR on the show floor. And for people that, have, you know, are really, they don't have trouble with the Oculus or the Vive or anything like that, uh, <laughs> apparently it's making some people really sick, um, motion sick. So... That's something they're definitely going to have to work on addressing. And interestingly, what I kind of found was that I think, I don't know if it's just Resident Evil or if it's just P PlayStation games uh, in VR for in general, but it sounds like, you know, in for a PC, you've got the Vive and you've got the Rift. And they're saying that you want to have, at minimum, 90 frames per second so that you don't get things like motion sickness and, you know, things don't go out of whack because it's a lot more jarring when you're in VR compared to just when you're screen hiccups. Um, you know, you avoid things like motion sickness and nausea and just other weird, just even immersion issues. Um, you know, you avoid some of that. But it sounds like Sony, at least for that game, I don't know if it's for PlayStation VR in general, maybe just because of the hardware, they're targeting a minimum of 60 frames per second, so maybe there is actually a difference of, like, you know, if it just pops under 60 for whatever reason, it's just a lot more noticeable. Um, I don't know, but it was kind of interesting that they were targeting a different, um, lower, kind of a lower frame rate um, for their VR. I, I kind of caught that tidbit earlier. Days Gone, the, you know, this is one I, I really don't know what to think about. It's, yes, it's another zombie game. It's another open world game. Oh, tell me if you haven't heard that before. And that's precisely its problem. Um, yeah, the, some of the combat looked okay. You're, I guess, this biker bounty hunter guy in this wasteland sort of a deal. Um, so there could be cool aspects about it. I mean, it's... It's not over-the-top ridiculous like a Dead Rising, you know, I don't know if it's going to be like, you know, a whole bunch of like consequences and things like that story-wise, like a, a Walking Dead. It just it doesn't seem to really have any identity except, oh, okay, the game looks, you know, graphically the game looks alright. There's a lot of zombies on screen and you get to shoot them or use environmental things to take them down or, you know, whatever. It, it just didn't really call out to me. It's like, oh, okay, now that's... I like the idea of a biker-themed thing, you know, okay, maybe there's a little Mad Max-esque sort of thing, except it's bikers, I don't know. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I... All I saw is what little bit they showed in the, uh, in the, uh, press conference, but could be interesting. Really have to wait and see if it's gonna have enough of its own identity for it to really catch my attention because like I said you know I love zombies like if it's the right thing like Left 4 Dead 
Left 4 Dead 1 and 2, amazing. I love those games to death. I played the heck out of these things. But there's so many zombie games. We have the silly kind. We have the serious kind. We have the, you know, slow, scary kind. We have the fast, action-y kind. The hordes, the, you know, one-on-one kind of scary things. Zombies have been done, like, endlessly at this point. And I'm actually kind of getting sick of open world. Like, there's aspects I love about open world. Yes, I love to explore. I love to do different things, you know, make my own fun. But sometimes, like, I kind of just, I'm getting to the point where, like, just, you know, take me on a wild ride. If it's linear, that's fine. You know, tell me a cool story. Take me on a wild ride, you know. Um, I I don't know. Um like, everything's kind of starting to sound similar. Either it's swords and bows, or it's guns in a city, and guns and cars, but it's just like, uh, I don't know. Kind of getting burnt out on the open world thing. I mean, it's got to do something really special for me to really get excited anymore. Of course, they covered Call of Duty, or was it Infinite Warfare? Which is kind of actually kind of neat because they they focus it on oh yeah by the way hey yeah we're going into space well battlefield is going to World War One nah we're going into space and we're gonna fly these little ships and do dog fighting and then we're gonna land on a big old like I forget if it was like a ship or a carrier or something or a space station but jump on to whatever it was and they're running around, you're shooting dudes, jumping from different, you know, with the gravity and stuff, um, and you're shooting guys, and like, oh, by the way, I'm just going to make you explode or, like, punch you, and you go fly, flying off into space. Um, I don't know. Especially for the campaign stuff, that might be at least something different enough for me to really take notice. Um, the kind of crazy, over-the-top space thing might kind of be interesting. And believe it or not, uh, it sounds like it's going to be exclusive at least to PS4. Not sure if they're going to bring it over to PC, but uh, yeah, Sony's getting its own exclusive Spider-Man game. Um, they showed a little bit of like brief open world sort of swinging footage and stuff like that. Looks okay. Um, we'll see. I mean, it might just be based on the upcoming uh, Marvel movies that they're going to do. So we'll see how that goes, but... Yeah, I think I've heard that it's supposed to be exclusive, so it's not going to be, oh, Xbox One and um, Wii U or NX or whatever. We're not going to get those. So, I don't know, yeah, I guess a new Spider-Man. That'll probably be open world, too. And, of course, Crash Bandicoot. That's been rumored as well. Well, yeah, they're coming back. Um, they're remastering, what is it, the first three games? in the series, and they're bringing them back for PS4. I never really got into the Crash Bandicoot games all that much. I played, I think, the first one or two briefly, and, eh, yeah, they were okay, but especially once I saw Mario 64, I'm like, nah, I'm playing Mario. This is just really cool. Um, so, yeah, if you're into Crash Bandicoot, it's coming back. It's, he's also being put into the latest Skylanders game with his own Skylanders figure, if you're into that sort of thing. And they really, if I remember correctly, they really didn't talk about PlayStation Neo, so I, I, we know there's going to be one coming. We don't know when. You know, we didn't know if it was going to be maybe later this year, but I would suspect, I, if I had to suspect anything, probably next year we're going to have these kind of mid-console cycle uh, well, I don't even know if we're really going to have a console cycle. It's just going to be like, oh, by the way, we ha by the way we have our PlayStation brand, we have our Xbox brand, and they're just going to be basically computers, and like we're going to upgrade them every two, three years, like we do phones. Um, it looks like that's what we're going into right now. So it's a really interesting kind of a shift in what's actually happening in the realm of console games these days. PlayStation VR, of course, that is coming out this October, and they did have a segment on some PlayStation games. They had a... The problem with a lot of what I saw, I mean, okay, they took key franchises, like you've got your Backham, uh, Backham, Batman, Arkham, 
VR. You've got Final Fantasy, was it 15 VR or something like that. Um, there were a couple of other ones, I forget even what they were, but they kind of seem like they're going to be these little shorter tech demo-y things, so it's not necessarily going to be like a full meaty game. But I can't really fault them too much for it because, you know, even the stuff that you're getting on, you know, PC through Oculus or through Vive, you know, everyone's still trying to figure out VR. So, yeah, you are getting some more simpler experiences right now. Um, and in a way, you know, like, I'm okay with that. You know, let it build in. But, you know, the, the, thing, the thing is that it has to be priced correctly because you know you get someone who's like oh batman i love the arkham knight or the arkham asylum games and they get oh batman arkham vr and then they get it and it's like oh it's a maybe a short you know hour or less experience and if it's charging too much people are gonna not be super happy with that you know and if you're tying vr to these core franchises that people are familiar with you know they're gonna want the quality of that franchise or series, or what have you, they're going to want those to be, you know, at least the VR experience to sort of reflect that. So, I yeah, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I mean, there, there's a few in there. Like I said, the Resident Evil, that was kind of a really cool thing of like, oh yeah, by the way, you can play the whole game in VR. So they're actually designing it to be played both ways, TV and VR. So that is definitely something to keep an eye on. Then we move to Nintendo, which they're they don't have it they don't hardly have anything on the show except for Zelda. Um they don't you know they didn't have a press briefing. They instead they had the Nintendo Treehouse on Tuesday and Wednesday just doing a whole bunch of Zelda streams, which by the way they call it Zelda The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Kind of a, a neat game. Um, I've seen not a whole lot of footage of it, but I've watched a few videos, and I've seen some variety. Boy, let me tell you, they have, you know, people have saying, been saying for a while, they've wanted a new type of Zelda. Well, you're getting a new type of Zelda. Um, I've heard it referred to which is kind of a funny name, but I've heard it referred to as Zelda Scroll or Zelda Scrolls for as <laughs> Zelda and Elder Scrolls. Yeah, they open it up. It's this giant open world. You awake in a cave with like hardly anything, like the original Legend of Zelda, where you woke up with basically nothing, and you don't just get a weapon. You know, your your one sword, and then oh, you get the Master Sword later on. I mean, everything has changed. Like you're actually you get a weapon, you have to forage for items, craft things, um, cook. You can, you know, eat raw food, but, you know, if you cook it and figure out recipes, then you'll, you know, get more health back or you'll get other benefits if you cook over a campfire. Of course, you're fighting things, uh, fighting, like, moblins and different things, but, like, Weapons break in this game, so you're actually fighting creatures and enemies and use, you know, once you do, you uh, take their weapons and use them because, you know, you only have limited use of these weapons. So that is a huge change. Uh, Link can now jump, of all things. Yeah, that's kind of a weird thing. He can climb, you know, he cl they focused on, like, climbing mountains and walls and ledges and different things. Um, so you're going to find some stuff on really high plateaus that you're trying to get to, and you have like an endurance meter, so you really have to watch that if you're climbing up something super high um, that you can run out of uh, endurance and cause yourself some trouble. There's actually voice acting in The Legend of Zelda now. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure, because I know one of the characters during the demo, like this old guy that Link was um, talking to, was not voiced. And I don't know if that's just the way the demo was, or if that's the way it's going to be for the whole game. I was hoping 
not just for immersion's sake. Like, I'm fine if Link doesn't talk. And matter of fact, I, I would prefer it. But I would hope, I was hoping that, like, the re every other character in the game, I was hoping that they would be all voiced. And again, maybe it's early enough, maybe they just haven't added the voice acting for that guy in the demo. Um, but I, you know, maybe it's going to be like major characters or major plot points are going to be voiced, but your typical like NPC villagers maybe are not going to talk, you know, through audio, but you know, not just for immersion, but for accessibility. Yeah, I would love it if all the characters were voiced because it's much easier for me to listen to a bunch of dialogue, um, than reading a bunch of it. I've kind of grown less tolerant of reading a whole bunch of dialogue in a game or a bunch of text in a game these days. It's like, I want to play something. I don't want to sit in menus all the time. I don't want to, um, you know, read a whole bunch of text dialogue. But the, at least the nice thing with Zelda is, sounds like they're actually going to be... They're going to be... Um, They're, they're going to let you, like I said, you're going to start, you're going to wake up, you're not really going to have anything, they're not, you know, like, unlike the last few Zelda games where they just give you tons and tons of, like, exposition, or explanation of what's going on in the world, and blah, 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 like, no, just let me, just let me play the damn game already. Um, it sounds like they're actually going to do that, they're actually going to just, okay, here you go, go figure it out. Kind of like the first Legend of Zelda. Like, when you popped into that first Legend of Zelda game on the NES, it was totally new. You didn't know what the heck was going on. You know, you walked it forward, you went into the cave, you got the um, the sword, and you could just go anywhere. Like, you know, I don't know, you, you, you know, they made it pretty easy so you could find the first dungeon, but beyond that, it's like, nah, go figure it out. And it sounds like um, Breath of the Wilds is going to be... Um, is going to return to that. So, boy, that's, yeah, that's going to be definitely one that I'm going to have to play next year. The only question is, am I going to play it on the Wii U or when Nintendo finally lets us know what in the hell the NX is actually going to be, am I going to want to go ahead and grab that right away? You know, how compelling is that going to be or can I wait? You know, because uh, there are things I love about Nintendo. I love their games, but like, there are certain things about Nintendo that just still aggravate me to no end. Like, they do not understand online. Or oh, they're getting better, but they just kind of don't get it. If I have to, like, if they, you know, one of their big hype features is, oh, you can buy Super Mario Brothers for the 14th time on this new system. I don't care. I'm done. Virtual console, great idea. But, you know, like with Steam, if I bought a game that came out in 2003, I can still play it. As long as the operating system is compatible, they've updated it, I can play it. I don't have to buy the same game every new system. Um, like, I, you know, I, I, there's Nintendo Classics that I would just, I'd love to be able to just pick up and play digitally at any time, but like I said, I'm not buying A Link to the Past, I'm not buying Punch-Out, I'm not buying any of this stuff over and over and over again, I'm just not doing it again. So, we'll see what the NX brings, and uh, we'll see what kind of tune we sing when they unveil it, whenever they do, at this point, I don't know. Maybe Tokyo Game Show, maybe they talk about it, I don't know. But, um... And that kind of wraps up E3. I mean, I know there are, like I said, there's tons of games that weren't mentioned in the press conferences. But, I mean, that's just a huge ones that pe their people are highlighting. I mean, I, I know some people are loving it. Some people are, you know, I've heard a few people on Twitter won't call out anybody. But they're like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm really tired of the first-person shooter. There's so many first-person shooters. And I would agree with you um, to some degree. But what, but the difference is... What I'm excited about is, yes, there are a lot of first-person shooters, but I like the return to more of the classic first-person shooter. I'm really tired of the military, the Call of Duty, the Battlefield, the 
you know, whatever it's going to be. I'm tired of those kind of games. I want games like Wolfenstein, 3D, like Doom, like Quake. Oh, God, you know, like I said, I talked about Quake in the other video. Um, there's a game called Strafe that is coming out that I want to know more about um, that's supposed to play like a, a classic 90s. Like I said, I mean, I want it fast, like where you where when you're running, you're, you feel like you're running 80 miles an hour. You just shoot dudes, fast, fun weapons, just, you know, arena style multiplayer, uh, you know, deathmatch, kill anything that moves, single player where it's just like, you know, kind of like what the Doom remake did. Like, the single player on that was fantastic. Um, I still got to go back and play more of that because it's just fun. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I want to play more of that. Um, I really do. But, um, so those kinds of shooters I'm actually looking forward to. Um, you know, and they're starting to actually differentiate. I think even... You know, like I said, Call of Duty is going to space in the future. We're going World War One, so they're you know people they're actually finally finally starting to to tell, oh yeah, maybe you are getting tired of the modern day military shooter. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about WWDC. I know this video is going to be going on long for like forever, um, but I want to talk a little bit about that. I, thankfully, it probably won't be very long. I'm not going to go through their whole press conference. Basically, because I was not super impressed. Um, I knew it was going to be all about software, and I'm fine with that. Um, but I was hoping for some, you know, really kind of cool new feature of iOS 10 or something. But really, the stuff that they announced didn't do much for me. Um, you know, they started all, they talked about Apple Watch. They basically redid watch OS 3 so it actually runs supposedly runs fast uh, you know it actually even on the current gen watches you know it actually runs the way it's supposed to for what you know it's supposed to now so that's a good thing um, they redid that um, OS X is now Mac OS, and I totally had it on the tip of my tongue, but I can't remember what the new, uh, it starts with an S. Um, I'm not a huge Mac user. I am definitely PC, so I don't really pay as much attention to the Mac stuff, but um, I can't remember what the new Mac OS is actually called. I apologize. Um, but yeah, they're renaming it Mac OS. Um, it's getting Siri. You're getting a new file sharing kind of a system between Mac and OS. You can copy text and from one and go from one to the other, like from a phone or tablet to your computer, I guess, which is kind of neat. Uh, you can unlock your computer with your thumb, your fingerprint, with Touch ID uh, from your phone, I guess. Um, I really don't remember what too much of what else was on the Mac, um, but you know, so they're doing a few updates to that. You know, for iOS and the Mac, though, Siri, I was hoping that that would have been a bigger thing because, yeah, they talked about it, but it really doesn't seem like they've done a whole lot to make it, like, more comparable to Google and Amazon because, uh, or even Microsoft with Cortana. Like, you know, they, Siri was cool when it came out, but, like, the other services you know microsoft and amazon and google are kind of really doing a lot better than apple is right now and at least what i will say i'm glad <clears throat> that not just with siri but apple is actually opening a lot of their stuff they're at, they're letting they're having apis so that um, like you can, other apps are going to be able to take advantage of Siri and be able to use some of their like messaging things. And like, you know, you actually be able to kind of more interoperability between apps and features, uh, both on the Mac and especially iOS where everything is, you know, the whole sandboxing argument, you know, is it good? Is it bad? Is it restrictive? Um, I get why they do it, and in some ways I like it, but in some ways it's like, no, just, you know, 
make your stuff work together. Like, do I have to, you know, go into a separate screen just to, um, or a, go open an app just to do a quick little task, you know? Um, so they're doing some of that with, like, the force touch kind of thing. Um, adding different things to the lock screen. They announced, like, more stuff for HomeKit, more compatibility with, you know, all kinds of um, home automation stuff. You can just swipe over, I think, to the right or whatever, and you can, anything that you have configured in your, uh, you know, through your home kit thing, you can control right from your lock screen or from the control center. Uh, messages are supposed to, you know, like you can, you can do more with the messages from the lock screen. They actually spent a whole long time, well, that was one of, they had like, for iOS, they had like, we're going to talk about 10 things, and one of them was messaging. And, like, I, I do text messaging. I do, um, you know, iMessages. But I, I don't care about emoji. I don't, like, okay, you can play embedded videos. That's kind of cool, I suppose. Um, but they talked about, you know, like, oh, emojis and making them bigger and then making your text bigger and invisible ink and I, a lot of the a lot of the messaging stuff, like personally, I just don't care about. So I will use like a percentage of that. I will use hardly anything of what they talked about in there. Um the one quote that I did find funny, and, like, he joked about it, but, like, I'm, th I'm thinking, you know, you kind of better be careful what you say, because I'm already kind of seeing that. They were talking about the emojis and stuff. They were focusing on that, and they're like, oh, well, yeah, well, pretty soon kids aren't even going to be able to read anymore. They're just going to be in, like, an emoji. I'm thinking, oh, God, if you only knew, man, like, people already talk in, like, text speak and can't form a coherent sentence and you know pictures for everything you know can't use words I mean I'll get off my high horse but it's like eh you my, that I wouldn't encourage that even further um, you know I like somebody or if I'm talking to someone either verbally or in text I would like them to at least form a coherent phrase if not a sentence you know um, I sure, I suppose emojis have their place, but again, I just don't like, no, I like to talk in words. Um, the photos thing was kind of neat. Um, they're doing image processing, I guess. So like, they'll be able to identify and they have these moments where they call them moments where like you can, you can, uh, sort people like uh, pictures by people that are in them or location or like, oh, these, oh, you um, went to a snowy area. Maybe I'll show you another uh, vacation where you went skiing or s to a snowy area or you went to a beach or whatever. Um, but what I see is if they're doing this recognition, I want to know how that stuff works with voiceover. And especially for a totally blind person, that could actually have really interesting potential for for them. It's like, let's say, oh, you got a shared account and you have photos and stuff. Maybe you want to show a sighted person or you even want to do something for yourself, you know, you want to be able to find this certain picture of whatever, you know, whatever, maybe a certain picture of your vacation photos or of a certain person, you know, will it, will it give me that information with voiceover to be like, Oh, this is the picture where, um, I was standing in front of this famous landmark or whatever that I wanted to show somebody when I went on vacation. Um, or is this a picture of like where I, you know, I, took a picture from like high up on the hotel and there was just tons and tons of, you know, fancy, uh, fancy boats in, in the dock, you know, I don't know, but that kind of thing could be really interesting or even just knowing who is in a picture. So potentially I'm rather curious to see what that's going to do. Um, Apple music, they're revamping that. So if you're an Apple music user, that should hope, hopefully be better for you. Um, I haven't really got into that at all because I've started using Google Music last year and I've been really hooked on it ever since. I I really, really, really like Google Music because I can play not only like 
you know, I can play playlists and mood, you know, like, oh, I'm in the mood for this kind of music. But I can also, if it's, if I'm paying for their service and if I, like, as long as it's in Google Music's ca- or Google Play's catalog, um, I can call it up on demand and just play it instantly, be it an album, a song, whatever. I can just play it. It's pretty awesome. So, you know, Apple Music, they're revamping that. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's, like I said, I'm not going to cover everything because we're going to be here for like another decade. Um, but really, I'm just trying to think of anything that really jumped out at me. Like, oh, the other thing that I really thought was kind of cool that they addressed on stage <clears throat> when they were talking about the Apple Watch, they talked about, you know, how you can set reminders now for like, oh, hey, get up every 20 minutes, get up every half hour, uh, you know, time to stand. Well, for wheelchair users, they actually implemented things for, like, they call it time to roll. So it's like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, get up or, you know, like, get a reminder and then, you know, just kind of stretch your arms and, you know, kind of wheel around a little bit just to kind of, you know, keep your arm muscles going and whatever. I mean, so that's kind of a cool that they thought of that. And then also adding for more of their exercises, they actually talked about, hey, we've actually added some exercise routines for people in wheelchairs so like these are some exercises that they can do to um still get their exercise in and that was cool that was a really cool thing they also talked about a breathe like that i forget what it's even called but like a whole app focused on breathing you know breathing exercises uh which is supposed to have you know nice health benefits and stuff like that i'm not gonna knock it you know i haven't really tried it um, you know, but it could be kind of neat. Um, they have that, uh, tvOS and iOS, you're getting a universal, uh, universal login. So instead of having to like, I guess, I don't know exactly how it works, but if you're subscribed to like Hulu and HBO and Netflix and Apple and God knows what else, like you can kind of get it to where like, you'll be able to universally uh, you have a universal login and actually access all of your services and have it not maybe be so clunky. So, hey, yeah, I, I'm welcoming of that. Uh, Apple TV is getting a dark mode. They announced that on stage, which I was actually pretty happy about because they mentioned, oh, well, maybe you're, you know, you're watching TV in a darkened room, you know, like a home theater. Well, that's great. And I'm hoping, 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 because I've been saying it forever, that I'm hoping that iOS gets a dark mode because that bright white is really harsh, especially for low vision users with glare and light sensitivity or people like me who decide I don't really have a lot of lights on in my apartment, no matter what time of day it is. And I <laughs> turn my phone on and all I see is like a bunch of bright white. And I'm like, oh, geez, really, you guys got to tone that down a little bit. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, wisdom prevails and that we will also, if they're doing it for Apple TV, please, 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 please put it back in to iOS and even the Mac as well. So um, I'm sure I'm missing something. I know I didn't cover a WWDC near as much. Part of that is I didn't find it all that interesting. And part of it was is around that time, I was actually paying attention to two conferences because X, the Microsoft conference was wrapping up and WWDC had started. And then midway through that, um, the PC gaming show started, which I didn't even talk about really, uh, because I really didn't watch much of it. I had it on in the background and I had the Apple keynote on in the background and I got little bits and pieces from them and read up on a little bit of both of them later but it was right around that time where also that itch to unbox my new toy overpowered me. So, yeah, um, I really didn't get maybe as much out of the Apple Keynote as I maybe would have. But it kind of seems like I didn't miss a whole lot. Um, and the PC gaming show, I mean, one thing that I would say that they that is kind of cool is... I'm not much of an AMD guy, like, especially the graphics cards. Like, I they used to be ATI. I had ATI cards in the past, and they always gave me problems. They were great when they worked, but I always had problems with them. 
and ever since I've used an NVIDIA card, I've just, I've never had problems. They've been reliable. They've been a solid card. And so I've just, I'm an NVIDIA man, you know, through and through now. It's going to, you know, I, I really have no reason to change. But what I will say is that if you want a decent high-end card, at least maybe to get into VR or to be able to play some of the modern games, um, they're shooting for a card that is around $200 that will actually let you play Oculus Rift and HTC Vive um, VR games. So, you know, if you don't want to pay the higher-end NVIDIA cards, um, you know, the GTX 970, 980, and now they're 1080, um, you know, the, the AMD stuff might be a way to go for you. Um, that was one of the things that I did here. Uh, like I said, I'm not a huge ATI or uh, ATI or uh, no AMD. Ugh, I got it mixed up again. I'm not a huge uh, AMD guy myself these days, but uh, I know a lot of people like them. And like I said, if you're looking for a more cost-effective route, that just might be something you want to look into. One of these new Radeon cards for like about 200 bucks. Um. I think we're really going to wrap it up around there. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. I mean, I'm sure if I thought hard, I could probably think of another dozen or two titles to talk about that are just on the E3 show floor that I'm looking forward to, yada, yada. What I will really quickly talk about is, like I said, this week has just been crazy. All of the E3 stuff. You have the WWDC on the same day. And then I think it was on Tuesday I saw the news that is kind of really rumbling through the assistive technology uh, community, the blindness community on Twitter and various places online. I can't remember the name of the, the, the parent company. I can't remember the initials. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of the initials. Basically, the parent company that owns Freedom Scientific and now Optelec has also, as of Tuesday, as on Tuesday's announcement, they have now also acquired AI Squared. Well, <laughs> what does this mean? Well, basically, um, all of the major screen readers and magnifiers, because AI Squared recently bought GW Micro, the maker of window eyes, so you had, basically, you had Magic and JAWS on one side, and then you had window eyes and zoom text kind of on the other, which was okay, that was fine, you had your competitors. Well now, <laughs> the parent company has just said, oh yeah, no, you know what, uh, we own everything. Um, so, you know, I know there's been a lot of buzz about like, you know, I've heard a few people talking about it, we're like, oh, it's going to be nothing but good for the consumer, and we're going to be able to, you know, pool all of our talents, and you know, all of our great talent will be under one roof, which yes, will be true, but I just can't help but feel a little bit mm, skeptical about this whole thing. I mean, it's just my, kind of my personal opinion. Like, competition is always good. Like, yes, I'm an Apple iPhone user, but I want Android to be good because maybe I want to switch to it uh, sometime. I want them to, you know, maybe they'll do something cool. Like, I like the way Android does its... Um, magnifier gestures a lot better than Apple, you know? So competition really breeds innovation and, you know, kind of keeps the other competitors on their toes. And now, I mean, you know, for the foreseeable future, yes, you're going to have both lines of products, but who knows if, you know, like, oh, maybe we'll, like I said, you know, they said on their FS cast, it's like, well, JAWS is kind of the more popular screen reader. Zoom Tech seems to be the more popular magnifier. You know, eventually, do they just go, hmm, well, you know, maybe, you know, we're just going to absorb magic into Zoom Text, or we're going to, you know, just basically make, you know, you have one major screen reader, you have one major screen magnifier. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> you know, and you can't really, you can't really compete price wise because if everyone owns the same uh you know the same like both magnifiers and both screen readers it's like well you you know one can't go oh well we're gonna have a heck of a deal 
and maybe prompt the other one to lower their price. Um, you know, I kind of think of it as like these, you know, kind of a Time Warner or Comcast thing. You know, you got Comcast trying to buy um, Time Warner. That got the kibosh not too long ago. But uh, is it just, you know, the AT industry has flown under the radar just because it is such a niche industry? And, well, maybe we don't want to mess with, you know, the disability field. Um, you know, we don't want to disrupt that, which is fine. But it's just... I mean, I know you have competition. I know it's not a complete monopoly. You have NVDA. You have system access. Narrator sounds like it's actually going to be getting quite good soon. Uh, I'm really interested to see their presentation in a couple of weeks at ACB. Um, sounds like there's going to be a great uh, presentation there. Um, but, like, as far as, like, your major competitors that everybody knows of, you know, it's all together now. I mean, like I said, yeah, there could be some strengths. There could be some good things about it. But, like, I, I don't know. I, I just, I don't, I'm just going to go ahead and say I'm not so sure that I'm a fan of it. You know, I you need a little bit of, you, you need some separate competitors to kind of keep things moving, you know. Uh, you know, because, you, you know, it's like, oh, they'll, maybe they, you know, maybe they won't. But it's like. You know, if we're the only competitor, we can kind of rest on our laurels because, like, well, we, you know, we we have the market, so we're, you know, we're good. You know, we'll we'll improve our product, but we don't have to be quite as, you know, frantic about it and really. I don't know. I don't want to ramble on because this video has been going on forever. But I all I'm going to say is that I really have mixed feelings on this whole acquisition, and I, I I'm just not so sure that I'm. You know, for now, it won't be a too big a deal because everything is going to operate as normal, but I'm curious to know what's going to happen in the future. Um, that's kind of a whole other topic because, like I said, with the price and everything, like your tr traditional screen readers, and especially screen readers, maybe not so much magnifiers, but like, you know, your traditional AT is uh, rather spendy. Uh, you get things like NVDA and SA to go, and then you know your mobile apps and things are really cutting into that. And I think they're actually starting to really feel the pain. And I wonder if that's where a lot of this is kind of coming from. Um, yeah, I I don't know. But we have wandered wandered around this uh, wilderness small town area for long enough. God knows how long I've been babbling. But I mean, I hope to God this actually recorded, because if it didn't, I'm going to be very, very angry. Um, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, hopefully you guys endured. If you did, congratulations. Um, that's about all I can say. Congratulations, and I hope to God you found it interesting, or at least informative, entertaining, whatever. But, uh, yeah, you know, follow me on Twitter at BGFH79. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It's, like I said, we've been getting a lot of subscribers lately, and it's been great to see. If you do follow me on the channel, follow me on Twitter, because I've been actually posting on Twitter a lot more these days. Um, so you may find some interesting stuff floating around there as well. So BG, BGFH79. Hope you guys enjoyed it and didn't, uh, you know, hope you guys enjoyed it or either that or you had a good nap, one of the two. But uh, until next time, talk to you guys again later.